Hi, um, we're here today for a curated conversation. Um, my name is Bradley Sumrall. I'm curator of the collection for the Ogden Museum of Southern Art in New Orleans. And I'm gonna be talking today with uh, Mapo Kinord from a ceramic artist from, uh, also from New Orleans, Louisiana. And we're coming to you from the city of New Orleans. Uh, I'm in Treme, Mapo's in, what's your neighborhood called? Uh, Mid City. <laughs> Yeah, you're on the border of a few neighborhoods right there, I believe. But, uh, so yeah, Mapo is coming from the mid city neighborhood in New Orleans, and this is a beautiful spring day, uh, April 11th, uh, 2021. May the 11th. Whoa, it moves so <laughs> fast. May the 11th. Um, so a little about uh, Mapo, a little background before we get into the work uh, in the current exhibition up at the Ogden. Uh, Mapo grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. She received her first training in ceramics through the Cleveland's Quaker-founded alternative high school, the School on Magnolia. And was it called School on Magnolia when you went, or did they change that? It changed just <laughs> as I was in there. So it was first friend school, and then I think that my second year went to the School on Magnolia. Yeah, interesting history of that place. I was, I mean, I wouldn't have known it except for in your biography, but I kind of went down a rabbit hole uh, with that educational institution, you know, so it was really interesting. But she apprenticed with several production potters uh, before receiving her uh, BFA from the Massachusetts College of Art in 1984. And she received her MFA uh, from Ohio State University in 1994 and got here to New Orleans in 1995. And she's now Associate Professor of Art at Xavier University, a well-respected educator, uh, um, Mapo has taught workshops in uh, Matsui, Japan, as well as the Haystock Mountain School of Crafts in Maine and the Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina. Um, her cont contemplative clay uh, project explores clay working as meditative practice, uh, and she's a lifelong scholar. And she's researched the traditional and contemporary art of Ghana extensively and has produced video documentation of the traditional pottery, kiln building, and ceramic architecture of West Africa. Uh, some of which is, some of that research is included in this exhibition in your actual piece. So thank you, Mopo, for being here with, me, with us today. Thanks, thanks for asking me to come. Thanks for, you know, putting the show on. Oh, it's an honor. Uh, and it's been, really been a pleasure as well. So up now at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art is, um, um, an exhibition of Mapo's work called Outside In, Improvisations of Space. And um, it really encompasses several um, elements of her, of her uh, production, but mostly uh, uh, from one particular series. But before we get into that, I just wanna get into a little of your background. And I don't know if I've ever asked you this question, but when did you first encounter clay? When did you first work uh, with ceramics? Well, um, you know, growing up in Cleveland, there was a place called Karamu, which was literally, it was an art center that was established, um, I think in the 50s, even, um, but by the 60s, you know, growing up there, uh, I actually went to preschools there and they had arts programs and theater, and they had a great theater program. Um, so I was sort of, you know, my, and my family is artistic. So, you know, I remember playing in clay when I was a little kid, mm. but didn't really get into it, you know, seriously until high school. What is it about the medium that, that drew you to it as opposed to painting or dance or theater? Or, um... Well, oddly enough, my mom is in theater. My oldest sister is in dance. <laughs> my other sister. My other sister paints and macrames and does jewelry. And it was like, what do I have left? <laughs> uh, but mostly it, it happened through an experience. Um, I cut school one day to go to my, my cousin's school and they had a ceramic studio in the basement and they had a wheel and it was like, this is so much fun. I'm like so bad at it, but it didn't matter. It was just physically fun to do. It's, it's, you know, I'm a tactile person. I like touches and stuff. Um, well, it's, I mean, the, the, you, you feel that in your work too. And also the movement does seem like dance at times, I think. 
Uh, and I know you have a drawing practice and that, that also um, shows through in the work, I, I, I believe as well. But uh, so you left um, Ohio, uh, went to graduate school and then landed in New Orleans. What brought you to New Orleans? Uh, let's see. Um, after, uh, when I went back to, when I went to graduate school um, from, and so it was like Ohio, Boston, California, then back to Ohio for graduate school. And, it, and at that time, Ohio had one of the worst cold winters you could think of. I was like, I am, <laughs> I am not staying. So uh, there was an Inseca conference, the National Conference for the Education of Ceramic Art, and they had a conference in New Orleans in um, 1994. And I went to that conference and I visited Xavier and got to meet John Scott, who was like, you know, the man's energy was like, whoa. And uh, the person, Lord Bennett, who was teaching ceramics was saying, I'm gonna retire. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I've got nowhere else to go. And, you know, and my father has ties. Uh, he had passed away in 79, but he had ties in, in the South and I had never lived in the South. So I was like, hey, I've been to the, <laughs> I've been to the North, <laughs> North Coast, been to the East Coast, West Coast, now, Gulf Coast. So, right. And this feels right. I mean, it, you know, it just felt right. Uh, all roads lead to John Scott uh, in New Orleans. <laughs> yeah. He really was a force of nature. Oh, my, um, yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm glad John Scott uh, hired you, I guess. Uh, he would have been the person to hire you, right? Uh, him and Ron, but Ron Bichet, the two of them sort of tag teamed me in. So um, I had, when I got to New Orleans, the job had already been taken, actually. And so I had other jobs doing, uh, I had at one point like five jobs at the CAC, at NOMA, at uh, um, the Talented Program. And so it was um, through you know, getting involved in the NCA, which is a national conference of artists in New Orleans, mm -hmm. that I, you know, got into this network of, of black artists here in New Orleans. And so through them, you know, I was able to make connections. And then Scott was so generous about his information. So it was like, I, I felt like I got a second graduate degree just hanging out because he would just let me come to his class and do his assignments assignments that I didn't have when I was in graduate school that I was like, man, I never did this. <laughs> this is really cool. So, you know, it was, you know, I was, a, I was his student actually for a while and then, um, and he respected what I did. So, you know, it was, it was good. It was a good match. Wow. And of course we see a piece of early Ron Bechet behind you that the tree, yeah. the landscape, yeah. <laughs> um, so, Tell us a little bit about your studio practice um, then and now, uh, how it developed and do you create, uh, one of the questions I think a lot of people ask me um, is, is, do you also create utilitarian wear on top of your sculptural practice? Yeah, I started out, I mean, I started out as a production potter and did that really the first, I would say the first eight years was really focusing on pots and so and because my teacher's teacher was Toshiko Takiezu, who was um, an amazing ceramic artist, and, and you know, it was uh, that sort of Japanese tradition that I felt an affinity to. And, and so I loved making pots, I loved working on the wheel. And then when I went to undergraduate school, uh, at one point, <laughs> one of my teachers, uh, uh, Jana Longacre and uh, actually Jana Longacre and Ben Ryder Band. I had a critique once and they, you know, they saw this table full of pots, you know, stuff that I had, had been doing for a while. And I, I can't remember, you know how you have a critique and everything is a blur, but what I did remember was the phrase one trick pony. <laughs> and that was like, oh, do, oh no, <laughs> I, am, I am not going to be that. So literally after that critique, I like destroyed half of those pots and just, you know, realized that I was leaning on that tradition and hadn't really explored 
um, what I had to say as a person uh, with this material. And so I sort of re kept trying to reinvent myself. And that took a while. You know, it's like when you get out of undergraduate school, you're still, you know, you still got the stamp of all the stuff that, you know, that you've been exposed to. And it takes a while of, of living before mm -hmm. you really develop, feel like you have something important to say. And so it wasn't until I moved to California um, and got married and got unmarried that I, I realized um, I had some, you know, I, I really wanted to make work that talked about my personal experience. So going to a uh, Catholic school for the first, you know, uh, eight years or nine years of my life, uh, that and going to church back then, you went to church every morning. <laughs> it's, you know, in, in Catholic school back in the 60s and the early 70s. So that space, you know, that, you know, seeing those niches and, and you know, the, the architecture of a church and St. Adelbert had this, you know, it was just a, it was a beautiful church. And so, and my father was an architect and a technical uh, artist. And so, you know, the architecture stuff started kind of creeping into my work. And so creating these spaces uh, was something I wanted to try and do to sort of create altars to a certain extent. So, and I, I, you know, got into one and then got into more and started developing them. And, and then it became a, a way of me being able to do a bunch of different stuff, you know. Well, I mean, I think you've taken us right into um, the exhibition with that answer. So I'm going to share my screen a little bit. Um, okay. So the title of the exhibition, Outside In, Improvisation of Space. Um, and I, the title really came from our conversations uh, and about your practice and the fact that there is an exterior form and then there's these interior worlds within those spaces in the Shrine series in particular. And um, this show is mostly works from the Shrine series, but also some works that uh, I don't think are of Shrine series, like um, the title piece on the, on the front wall, uh, Inheritance. That is more of a figure, figurative piece, an improvisation, improvisational form. Um, but they're definitely of the same process and, and tradition, but they're just the forms are separate. So a little, I'll take a look at a couple of the, um, this is the piece I just mentioned. This is the title wall of the exhibition. This is Inheritance from 2018. Um, this is a good place to start talking about your surfaces, I believe, because um, that's one of the conversations that come out with when I'm touring a new um, um, a viewer of your work uh, through the work. One of the first things they ask about is the surface and and how you get these colors and and I, you know that they're painted and not glazed, and that leads to the. Always, I'll tell them. Listen, she's a master of glaze. I've seen her utilitarian wear. She's, she's masterful, but with these works, you choose not to use glazes and paints instead. So, can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Um. Oh gosh, there's so many there's so many reasons behind this, but mostly because I like I like painting. I like this is an opportunity for me to be a painter, and it's layer, you know, I paint in layers and layers on top of each other. And um, it's fun to see it on, you know, to see the color exactly what I want right then and there. Um, and to be able to experiment, to do a good amount of experimentation with metallics and matte, you know, surfaces. Um, it would probably take me like a lifetime. <laughs> to be able to do this in glazes. And, and the other element is that you have to fire the piece again. And so oftentimes, you know, firing a piece more than once, it gets to be more and more dangerous <laughs> in terms of the risk taking of, you know, um, what happens with the fire. Um, but mostly it's because I, I like seeing instant color and, they, and they're, for me, they're canvases. So, 
you know, instead of having a square canvas, I get to have a three dimensional canvas that I can can play around with and have and have fun with. Um, it also I realized it came in handy if somebody breaks your work. <laughs> um, I actually had somebody break one of my sculptures. Um, they had bought it, they had it for years, and I, I guess they had it at their home and something happened to it and they took it back to the gallery and said, uh. and as a challenge, I asked myself, could I put this piece back together and repaint it? And if it was glazed, there's no way I could have, it would have been over, no right. way. But I was able to get it back together, you know, fill, fill cracks and do all that kind of stuff and resurface it. And so that was actually, you know, I felt like a conservator. <laughs> Right. And basically, it ended up looking almost exactly the way I had originally had it. Um, wow. you know, a, a different in, in, I know the difference, but I, I think as some other people may not have, uh, you know. So, well, it definitely gives your uh, ceramic work a unique uh, look and feel because they're not glazed and it does feel very, very painterly and there's layers of nuanced color. Uh, that you could never get with a with a solid glaze. Um, Not even layered glazes. I mean, you would have to, yeah, and it's mostly because there are metallics in there. And so even when you're looking at the work, it, depending on what angle you're looking at, you will see some colors and not see other colors, mm -hmm. depending on the lighting. Well, here's uh, some installation views of um, of the exhibition. Uh, we have three from the Shrine series on the right, and then the only other piece that is not from the Shrine series, which is Cosmic Key to the left, that beautiful keyhole right in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, but as as you can as as a viewer can see these now, these have the the Shrine series have exterior spaces and interior spaces. There's three other uh, works from this exhibition. And these are very, very large. What's the largest? What uh, I forget. How tall is Stupa? Stupa, not Stupa, but um, of, of God and Ground. Of God and Ground. Yeah, that's the largest piece, I believe. Yeah. yeah, on the pedestal, it's about. It's a little over six feet. Massive, and that's a solid. That's one piece of clay that was fired, um, in the kiln. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the kiln anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, actually, that kiln doesn't exist anymore. I'd have to go. I'd, I'd have to find out, like, where June, you know, go to, go to Nebraska and June Kaneko to to be able to get to some big, big, big kilns. Maybe one day. And then uh, of stones and bellies, the gray piece there uh, is probably the second largest piece in the show, of similar scale. Um, Massive, thing, massive yeah. piece. Yeah, massive pieces. Um, but let's take a look at a single piece because we're not going to have time to go through the, the narrative. And that's one of the things I love about your work. It's so rare to find a clay artist. Um, and I'm not sure that I've ever found a clay artist that has the level of narrative uh, that you bring uh, to the shrine pieces. Um, so we could spend an hour talking about each individual piece in this exhibition, probably. So I've decided that for the Shrine series, we're going to choose one, and that way we can dive deep. Uh, so we're going to look at the most recent piece. And total transparency, I never saw this finished until the show was happening. Um, I just trusted in her vision, and I saw the basic form that she was, uh, that was still soft clay she was working with. Uh, and I said, yeah, we'll include it. Let's go for it. And it surpassed my expectations. It, uh, it's a masterpiece. Uh, so in my beginning, tell me when you'd like me to move forward in these um, slides. So tell us a little about this. Uh, this piece was actually started um, right after the, in March, March of 2000, when we got sent home from you know, for COVID. So I was teaching at Xavier and um, we, they told us in March, we had to go, we had to, you know, we couldn't stay. So one of the things that was difficult when you're teaching a ceramics class is how do you teach ceramics 
<laughs> via Zoom. Yeah. So I, <laughs> so I, I had started this piece actually a little bit before the class, uh, before we, we went on. It may be just less than a week, really. And so it was at the very early stage. So my students actually got to see me build the beginning of this piece. Mm. And then um, it took literally the, uh, I didn't, I didn't finish it. It took another few months to finish it because once I finished the form, uh, the general form, there are things that sort of need to be done. And, um, and that's where some of the surface elements come into play. So it was, if you can imagine, this form was kind of naked in a way. It didn't have any of that, um, any of the, the uh, edges and, you know, it was, it was really a very smooth form. And so one of the things I wanted to do was to sort of um, elaborate. I had done a series where I was working with these edges and um, I, I just wanted to bring them back for this piece. And, you know, when you're working, it's stuff to, you know, your hands to start doing stuff. And it's like, oh, okay, this is what you're going to be. So it's, you know, it, it, it's always strange because I don't, I have an idea, but I don't plan. And so there, it's always a surprise on how they, they finish. And, and because I had four different doorways that were four different uh, forms, although they share a basic form. Um, I felt like I had to do something different on each doorway. Um, and I wanted to do something, you know, because the cool thing about sculpture is that you can't experience the whole thing. Like when you look at a painting, if it's a frontal painting, it's all at once. This is more like, you know, you have to take time. You have to walk around the whole thing. And in this case, you have to not only walk around it, but you have to look inside of it and you have to actually move your head around inside of it too. So this idea of making time a major element in the experience is a part of, is a part of what I like. Mm. Wow. I, I never thought about time as, a, as, a, as an element in this experience until now. Um, the surface is phenomenal and every photograph looks a different color almost depending <laughs> on the lighting you know and i think your experience with the piece would also be that way and if it were in a home with light that changed throughout the day i can imagine this piece changing color as the day you know just like the the, the light outside changes uh but how many how much layering is in this surface like um uh, if I showed you the first couple of layers of this piece, you wouldn't recognize it because it's like screaming purple, screaming reds, there are greens on one side, there's, you know, and so, and you can kind of see it in, you know, underneath. Mm. Um, and then on top of it, something that I hadn't done in a while is to use opalescent an opalescent color. And once you, and it was just like kind of magical in a way, because once I put that, if uh, the thin layer of opalescent color, you still saw the color, but then it pops back, you know, it goes back and forth in terms of being able to see it and literally seeing through it, seeing, seeing through the opalescent to the back. So it's, it's, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a, peekaboo and you know kind of tilting your head so that you, you don't want to get it on so thick that you can't see the colors underneath and that way I was able to do slight color variations from side to side it's really not that noticeable for most people but one side is actually a little bit more green and another side is a little bit more purple another I have side noticed is more that orange and red so it's kind of like and then there's little peekaboo areas that like in this side the what I call the peekaboo areas a little bit you can see red mm -hmm. and then another side purple another side blue yeah, let's see that's with the lights on inside and a beautiful base uh, but even though the base is elongated the 
the form itself seems very feminine. Uh, almost Georgia O'Keeffe-esque feminine, but, um, but also holds so much power. It's not a soft, gentle um, form. It's a very powerful form. Here we see again, this another uh, peekaboo as you're calling it, I believe, with the, uh, with the lavender color. Right, I mean, so much of, um, if, if we're gonna, there are sort of references to anatomy and the major thing is hips. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. And inside of your hips is your womb. And so this idea of hips are definitely a, you know, the unique anatomy of women, you know, for men, it's usually, you know, quintessential um, shoulders, but for women, it's, you know, it's our hips that are the, usually the most, at least when you mature as a woman, that's the part of your body we're going, where do those come from? <laughs> <laughs> um, and seeing that I, I inherited it a, a good amount from my mom, um, but it, again, this idea of that is our first home. You know, if we're talking about architecture and where we live and our first place that we spent most of, you know, the first nine months of our lives was in a pair of hips. Right. And so... Well, uh, speaking of architecture also, is there any particular, you mentioned the Catholic, the, the architecture of Catholicism earlier, but for some reason to me, this feels almost like the flaming doors of Tibetan architecture, you know, or something like that. Like it, um, it doesn't feel exactly Catholic to me, uh, this architecture with this. Piece. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, gosh, uh, in the eighties, actually, I got a chance to go to China, which mm -hmm. was, uh, a really incredible experience. I had been a part of the Chinese cultural center in Cleveland because as a teenager, I took Tai Chi and was exposed to a lot of the ideas and philosophies. And so I, I really took an interest in Buddhism because I saw a parallel between the ideas, you know, in terms of the spirituality. And so the architecture to me um, is very interesting. And again, stupas kind of sort of relate to that as mm -hmm. well, you know. Um, and I have, you know, I think genetically too, I have some, you know, there's some East Indian elements. I remember growing up and seeing my mom wearing a sari. And so Hinduism and all the rest of that stuff was coming at me as a kid. Um, I don't know whether subconsciously or whatever it is, but, you know, I spent a lot of time at the Cleveland Museum of Art and they had an incredible uh, array of, of Asian art too so you know combining that with you know so much stays in your head you know <laughs> and it just you know when you start making stuff it sort of leaks out of your fingers. An incredible museum with an incredible collection and uh, we're seeing the the result of having access to that as a kid so um, that that's that's fascinating um, but definitely I you definitely immediately sense that this is architectural um, for me, I, I almost immediately sense that it's non-Western, uh, but definitely has elements of that. Uh, but then once you said hips, that's the dominant form for me <laughs> from that point on. Um, so let's move forward a little bit on this piece. Let's get inside. So you've created that external architecture, that external form. And this is, again, this womb-like space, this temple, like like you're inside of a temple um, and there's a lot that's going on. So I'll let you start breaking that down for us. Um, of all the, the shrine series I had made, I had never made one about my family. And so uh, I wanted to make, I wanted to make this one about my, um, my mom and dad and my sisters and my grandparents. Um, but it's like, and one of the reasons why it's called In My Beginning, it's like, this is before, in some ways, the before I was born. And, you know, the environment. And again, it's sort of like being in that womb. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so the image um, to the left is my mom and dad. And over, 
oh, um, a transparency on top of that, that photographic image that transparency is another transparency of an article that was written in 1960 uh, of having a cross burned on our lawn uh, in, in 1960 in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and that was something my parents experienced while my mom was literally, while my mom was pregnant with me. I think it was born, it happened in July and I was born in September. Mm. So um, it was, I wanted this piece to talk about that history, given the time that we're in right now and the social political climate we're in to sort of, it's a, it's a part of my history. It's a part of my personal history. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, but it's like from the day I was born, <laughs> it actually literally before I was born, this is how America was treating my family. Mm -hmm. uh, or should I say certain individuals in America. Right. Uh, and it was, it was an interesting article um, in that it's the same date that Kennedy got the nomination for president. Mm. Um, so it was, this piece is really, a, in some cases, about my personal history, but about how it, it links to a bigger history. Um, the image on the right is my other sister, my uh, sister Deborah, who lives in Seattle, and she's only a year and a half older than I am. So we're the, you know, we were the closest growing up. And um, I really wanted to honor her and her influence on me because she was, she was an, she was the serious artist in the family. I mean, she was mm. drawing and painting and uh, the visual artist that really um, gave me something to go for to a certain extent and you know just seeing her be creative it was a intimidating <laughs> but it was um, it was very inspirational you know and there are aspects to her personality that uh, gave me a lot of freedom to be who I am um, so you know I, I really wanted to just sort of give a nod to her and it's today her birthday, I believe. Yes. Happy, happy birthday, Sister Deb. <laughs> yeah, Deborah's. Uh, she's, she's. Oh, I can't tell her. I can't no, no, her. don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, given the fact we're only a year and a half apart, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> had me, had me tell her all my stuff. Um, but you know, she. It's, it's. Thanks. Nice. You know, I'm feeling lucky that I have. Uh, that I grew up in a really creative family that, you know, it was, it was honorable to be an artist. I think in some families, they're like, you gonna starve or you gonna, you know, my parents are like, you can do whatever you want. You just better be good. <laughs> you better be better than anybody, anybody else, you know, uh, or, you know, try and know your craft, you know, which was what my dad, you know, really focused on. And so my parents were older and because my parents were um, older, uh, there was a lot of wisdom and so which is why that that writing you know that article doesn't affect them you know they're still smiling it's not they were they let you know it was a part of their experience but it didn't define them mm. and um, that's one of the things that I wanted to you know acknowledge in this piece and you know the flowers around them they're both um, passed away, so they're they're not with me anymore, and so they're they're with me spiritually. And so um, my sister, who is who I have uh, in my life, the jacks that are above that hang above her, was one of those things that we did when we were a kid. That was just it was just fun. I don't know if if kids have that experience. You know what kind of experience they have now, but playing jacks was like, you know, the onesie twosies around the world, all those little, you know, and just, I just remember laughing and just having a, you know, it was a good childhood, you know, it wasn't without stuff <laughs> as in most, as in most childhood, but, you know, it was, it was fun and it was creative. Mm. And then right above your sister, there's a little eye I believe in a in a frame. 
Yeah, that's the Kenord part of my family. That's uh, my mother's father's mother, who um, who I never got to meet. I never, I never knew her growing up. You, and, you're, that's your father's mother. Yes. Your father's mother. Okay. Yeah. And so, which, and because my mother's father died when she was an infant, and in mm. fact, my mom, um, she was, she was born in 1917. So. She lost all of her siblings in the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918, 1919. So wow. I grew up hearing about that and my grandmother, you know, pulling my mom through with, you know, these home remedies of turpentine and sugar. <laughs> right. um, so I wanted to acknowledge, you know, the Kenord side of my family. I, I have the Robinson side and the Kenord side. And how they're looking over us, you know, how their how ancestors look over us that are that are still here. And this is your mother's mother. This is the Robinson side. Uh, well, my mom is is Kenord. Your mom is Kenord. But but my grandmother remarried after she lost her her first her you know my mom's dad who died. When mm. she was little so she i grew up with her being a lewis elizabeth h mm. lewis and she had a um she had a, uh, a shop a, a ta she was a tailor in new york on saint nicholas avenue <laughs> this this woman was yeah this is okay. and i grew up i i knew my <laughs> this is the grandmother i knew very well mm. uh and she was you know she was she was great. She wasn't one of those warm and fuzzy grandmothers. Um, <laughs> and again, another creative, you know, she was a tailor. I mean, and mm. she, she only did men's clothes because she, she complained that, that women, their sizes would change between, you know, measurements. <laughs> uh, but um, she was, you know, she was in a remarkable, she was a remarkable woman with a lot of class and, a, and just it 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 showed me that a woman could have her own business, run her own life, you know, be creative and be a mom and you know um, and do some do some amazing stuff. I remember, you know, kind of after when she retired and moved to Cleveland um, as she got older, there was a whole story, <laughs> a whole story about how they cheated her out of her. They literally stole her property in New York uh, oh. from underneath her, um, you know, forged, forged signatures, all kinds of stuff, kind of crazy oh stuff. And, and so, you know, this, this history, you know, people think, um, you know, that the, the history of African-Americans in the United States, and oftentimes people think it's racism was about, you know, people calling you the N-word or but there were all of these little things that, you know, not that weren't so little to us, you know, redlining stealing, and stealing, stealing your, your property, you know, yeah. is not little. <laughs> no, this is not little. <laughs> it's not little. I mean, this is, this, you know, <laughs> my sister, my sister still says that my grandmother put a curse on that piece of property because uh, if you go to New York and you go to 8, 824 St. Nicholas Avenue, there's nobody living in that house, <laughs> not, at least not right now. Um, so, but she was she was an amazing woman, and I wanted to, you know, give a nod to her as well as my older sister, who is on both sides of her. So they're um, they're images of the of the important women in my life. You know, my oldest sister Sin, uh, Cynthia is actually lives in Japan, and she's an amazing dancer so you know all of these things are really about the creativity of my family and an homage to them wow um and here's a, another view we haven't what we haven't talked about is the uh glass and actually I'm, I'm just now realizing this is a photograph i took and you still had not completed that the broken glass floor um the broken glass floor fills out the entire space now. Uh, but 
what it does show is that you're then you're in the inside kind of looking out and you're looking out of at uh, i've gotten ground uh there another one of your forms but <clears throat> i guess is there is there do you consider those inside out views when you're creating the work um placing the work or is it only the outside in views that you're considering well the, you know they're <laughs> they play upon where where the work is and if you know depending on what's in that you know when you place the work itself what are you seeing so that the placement of the work can be designed um and i actually have a picture where you know i'm look when you look through one you see another one of my other sculptures in my studio so it's you know it's another way of interacting with space um and seeing you know what can happen um part of it too is like you know you live in new orleans and a shotgun house is like you know you look through <laughs> one in one interest and see the other and that's and that's the flow of spirit you know it's the flow of air it's the flow of a spirit you know you can get in and you can get out you know um and you have light you know you also have natural light that comes into the into the work as well but I think it's important to note that these pieces are wired so that light is that's not just natural light behind oh, yeah. the transparency of your of your parents, but that is a as an LED light that is running up through the actual <laughs> structure, the 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 stand. Um and into, yeah, I have into to, this clay. Yeah, that's you know, that's the other element. I have to be a little bit of an electrician <laughs> to to figure out where the lights are. So oftentimes when I'm making a piece, there are options. You know, there I have it so that there there could be a light here or there could be a light there. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of narrow it down. Um, but yeah, usually I want some lighting soft enough so that when you look inside, you have to wait a few minutes for your eyes to adjust. Mm because it's not bright. I don't, you know, it's not, uh, it, again, you can't see everything all at once. So once your eyes sort of adjust to that type of lighting, and then you start to see some of the details, you start to see some of the things. And one of the things about the glass is that the light bounces off of it, mm -hmm. you know, and it creates another sort of, um, in a little way, it's a little sort of textural ocean of light, you know, that's at the floor of this thing. Um, so again, another way that you're forcing the viewer to take their time. Time becomes part of the piece. They have to take their time, to, take the time to look inside, take the time to adjust to the light inside, and then to explore that internal uh, space. Yeah, because I think you know, so so often in this society and so often in time, it's like we're you know we don't spin everything has you know it's like it's almost designed to be fast and instant and and that's not how you you know if you want to get to know someone you need to take the time to really see who they are on the inside <laughs> you know not just this exterior thing you know and so that's really the challenge and so oftentimes it's interesting to see when you know people see the show and you know, there are some people who just walk around and they, they look around the outside and they kind of peek in and, and then somebody else will come in behind them and they'll stay a while and then they'll go, oh, wow. And then the other person will like come back and look <laughs> to see what they had missed. <laughs> I've so, seen that myself. Yeah, absolutely. But I've also noticed that whereas in, in a lot of shows, especially painting shows, you know, you're a lot of people will come and look at the label first, look at the painting, move to the next one, like it's an assembly line, you know, um, and um, that they're trying to get through a list real quick or something. And with your work, they do tend to look at the piece first rather than the label. And they do tend to spend, not everyone, but more, more people tend to spend more time uh, with individual pieces. Uh, and really digging into them and looking inside and trying to understand what's happening. So, mission yeah, mission. and that's, that's the whole, you know, for me, that's the whole point that you've got to literally move your body too. 
I mean, you know, people are different heights. And so, you know, oftentimes the openings are lower for people who are not, you know, really tall mm -hmm. um, and for kids to be able to, you know, to see it at their, you know, sometimes they may have to look up, but um, right. it's designed to be accessible. You well, know, and you're so wheelchair. thoughtful in every aspect in that way, even like the opening spaces, you know, it's not designed for you to look in. It's designed to get the maximum amount of people to be able to view this, whether they're in a wheelchair or they're, or they're you know, little um, children, whatever. Um, and so although you're very free in your improvisation of form and you do improvise and in, in form in that way, you're also very thoughtful and there's a lot of planning that goes in to each of these pieces prior to that improvisation, it seems. Yeah, I mean, you, you, know, you, you think about your audience. I mean, I'm, I'm um, and the one thing that's, that's great, it's like I can design, you know, work with Martin who designs the, the pedestals to get them at the height that I want. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the piece themselves are not from the floor. Um, they're arranged at a height, so. And when, when Mapo says Martin, she means Martin Payton, the mm -hmm. great uh, metal sculptor uh, from New Orleans as well. So, mm -hmm. um, who created every base in the show, I believe, maybe. With the exception of the two that are, that have, that are on that, traditional pedestals. Yeah, yeah, that have no iron bases or metal bases, yeah. Um, well, speaking of, I mean, that, that very act of working with the, an artist to create the bases uh, is an act of collaboration and collaboration seems to be an ongoing uh, theme uh, within your work. And so we decided to include two artists in the, ex two collaborations. Uh, in this exhibition, one collaboration with the artist Jackie Bishop and the other two uh, with the uh, late master sculptor Lynn Emery, uh, who did, we just lost uh, here in New Orleans. So um, let's start with this beautiful piece, Fallen Order, uh, it was a collaboration with Jackie Bishop, and maybe talk a little bit about the act of collaboration in general and also um, this collaboration in particular. I had, I had made this piece actually probably in 1999 or 98 and was stymied on the surface. I had painted the surface and didn't like it. And, and I had seen the work of Jacqueline. Um, I can't remember exactly what gallery, because uh, uh, I don't, I think it was before. Uh, she was at Arthur's, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but her work is amazing. And, you know, I, I got a chance to meet her and, and Jacqueline is, she's just a really wonderful person. You know, there are some people you meet and you love their energy and then, you know, to love their work and to love their energy. And so I asked her if she would be interested in painting, you know, painting the sculpture that I was having a hard time with. And she says, yeah, sure. And so, you know, I gave it to her and I actually gave her two pieces and um, this one and another, well, I gave her this one first. And I guess it was, I don't know how long this took, but it took several years I, to a point where I actually kind of forgot, <laughs> kind of forgot about it. And then when she gives it back, I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea that she was <laughs> just going to, I mean, take, I mean, it just brought it to life. It gave it like a narrative beyond more than I could have asked for. And so her work um, where she has traveled, you know, to Brazil and India and uh, as an environmentalist and just in, a, you know, uh, and also, you know, working in terms of civil rights and for, for individuals all over the world, you know, I her energy and her concerns are all sort of linked in. And so this is, you know, really about the environment and its relationship to how we've, you know, we can't keep taking and taking and taking. And so she spent a lot of time in the Brazilian rainforest. And so this piece is, is brings that, you know, brings it together, which I was 
ecstatic. <laughs> I was really happy about it. So it's it's a beautiful piece, and she's an artist that um, I have a lot of respect for. And we have uh, one major work in the Ogden Museum's collection that has been a workhorse for me. I've used, I've included it in so many exhibitions over the years. But uh, so it's uh, it's a thrill for me to be able to show another uh, Jackie Bishop and uh, Jacqueline Bishop and also a thrill to see such a successful collaboration. Uh, it's not always the case when two artists work together, especially when they're so different in their imagery and, and, and medium. Um, but gosh, it's successful. So uh, this is the back of the piece, although I know you have a problem with front, you don't like front and back on your sculptures. They're, they're all yeah, <laughs> equal. But uh, this feels like the back almost to me, uh, but it's definitely the darker, the darker side. Mm -hmm. And it's Jackie Bishop bringing a sculptural element as well as paintings to the piece. Yeah, she brilliantly, you know, translates the form. You know, she takes advantage of, of how the surface moves. And so as you walk around it, it really leads you, you know, it leads you around the form. And this, this, this kind of knob at the bottom becoming like a nest form. Uh, is is brilliant and uh, also like really clearly defining that that internal space as kind of a proscenium arch, you know, that where theater is happening uh, within. You know, it's 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 it was that. Had you intended that in any way or? Yeah, that's the way. I mean, in terms of form, that was how yeah. it was designed. Mm -hmm. And there's something about her work that lends itself to installations because she does you know she does installations mm -hmm. as well so i knew she would end up you know uh, activating the mm -hmm. spaces that she was given so and she did rather well <laughs> yeah it's a beautiful piece and i know that there's a second one that second form has just recently been completed uh, yeah. and i haven't seen it yet but i'm excited to i'm excited to see it it is amazing yeah it is it, it, <laughs> truly amazing um, so the next collaboration is, I think, one of the most perfect unions of two artists ever. <laughs> you and Lynn Emery uh, working together, it just blows my mind. Lynn, um, a master of kinetic sculpture, wind-driven, water-driven, magnetic or robotic-driven work, um, and then you're stoneware forms these beautiful improvisations and tell us a little bit about um this piece and i believe it's untitled because it was it wasn't titled i know we were hanging we were installing this piece the day that lynn passed from this mortal coil um and so it just never got an, a title that was agreed upon between the two of you is that yeah we it, we actually never talked about uh the titles. Um, so, you know, I didn't, uh, for this one in particular, because um, this was the piece that she had the most um, influence on, uh, I think, in, ter in terms of she, um, she, her, her elements really dictated what I did. Mm. Um, and so it was, um, I didn't want to add something to the, you know, it's like, that's the funny thing about titles. It's like when you add a title that directs someone to think about this or that or the other. And there are, there are things that I think about when I, you know, view the work, but I don't want to give that to someone else. And so um, decided to just leave it, to leave this piece untitled. I mean, if anything, it's, you know, it's, it's a collaboration. And so, you know. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a showstopper and a stunner. Uh, we, it's not in, none of the collaborations are in the interior space of your exhibition. Um, this one is actually in the ground floor atrium space of the Ogden, uh, but they're very much a part of the exhibition. And can you tell us a little bit about collaboration in general? Like, why are you so open, even more so than other artists I've seen? Like, what is it about collaborating that you like? Um, it gives me an opportunity to connect. Um, 
and to see what you know it's a it's a challenge in in a, in some ways and it's um particularly for people you know the people whose work i really respect and I'm, I'm curious to see what we could do together mm -hmm. and how we can be responsive to each other um these you know and it's funny because she and I referenced these forms, her, you know, the steel forms as these flames and flowers. And I keep thinking, you know, of the Hindu tradition of burning a corpse and also, you know, how flowers are also a part of that, you know, um, giving reference and deference to, mm -hmm. to someone. And so, you know, it's, and because I've spent a lot of times as a functional artist creating vases, this is both a combination of the, the base form really talks, you know, sort of makes reference to a pot. But then, you know, the, the forms that spring at the top of it really are in response to the forms that these, the flames, you know, the flower flames that, that she um, had for the, that she made for um, for us to collaborate with. So um, it just sort of it, it it you know for for almost a year we were kind of trying to figure out how to how to make the you know make the work work together mm. uh, because these pieces were originally designed for a different piece and it wasn't it wasn't working the same and so I literally responded to creating elements that echoed and related to aspects of her sculpture the, the flame the flame forms where there could be more of a conversation and this idea of really like taking up space you know when you have flowers in a vase you know oftentimes they're sort of bunched together you know mm -hmm. or and these they they get to sort of go out and take up more space and again you know when they interact with wind or so that they will spin and in mm -hmm. turn and so um again the sort of sense of time and the sense of of moving into wider space is what i wanted to wanted to play with mm. well i think there's so much that goes into this, but it really is the spirit of uh, both both of you as artists, uh, but also just the spirit of New Orleans in many ways that kind of uh, in the music and the jazz and the spirit of collaboration and of improvisation um, and two voices working so beautifully together. I'm just, I love this piece. <laughs> I think it's, it's interesting for me because it's not something that she would have done on her own. It's not something I would have done on my own. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's quintessential Lynn and it's quintessential me, but in a, in a way that we would have, wouldn't have done on our own. And that's, that's the thing I think I appreciate the most is that responsive element to me mm -hmm. in terms of even how the color responds to those forms. Right. Um, and then the final piece in this presentation um, is seeding, um, also a very recent 2021 piece, as seen at the Ogden uh, in the fifth floor uh, atrium space. And in the background, you can to the uh, to the left, you can see Lynn Emery's mitre uh, from the Ogden's permanent collection. There's also Fritz Boltman in the Mississippi River Bridge in the center and the contemporary arts and the art uh, in the background, but um, beautiful piece again uh, with that pot form, right? That uh, vase form. And that was the original piece um, that I we thought was going to work for the for the other flame pieces, and. You know, she we went we kept going back and forth, and it's like, no, this isn't working. No, that isn't working. It's just okay. Let's let me make something else for those flame pieces, which is what happened mm. uh, with that form. And so we had this one, and because I was working in her shop, and again wanted to do the kinetic, you know, 
I was drawing out what, you know, what forms would work. Uh, and so sort of coming up with this, this basic design and, you know, she took a look at it and said that, you know, she, she liked it. And so it says, okay, well, let's, you know, let's make this one happen too. So. Mm. Well, another beautiful, beautiful form um, and a great collaboration. And I've seen other collaborations that we just didn't have room for. Uh, you worked beautifully with uh, Ron Beche, and I'm sure there's a litany of other artists that I haven't seen uh, that you've collaborated with. So it's definitely part of your practice. Um, so, Mapo Kanord, Inside and Out, Improvisations of Space. Uh, it's actually Inside Out. That graphic is not right. That was an early <laughs> graphic. Sorry about that. But the exhibition does run March 6th through July 18th at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art. And coming up on June 12th, uh, we will be celebrating uh, this exhibition uh, at our annual fundraiser, uh, spring fundraiser, the Magnolia Ball. So you could come out then and celebrate my Poe or just come by during regular business hours and uh, uh, spend some real time with it uh, without the maddening crowd. So, um, Mapo, I, I hope you're happy with the exhibition. We're thrilled to have you at the Ogden, and thank you for showing with us. Thank you. It's, it was an honor.